So I want to preach on breakthrough, and I want to preach a message that I've never preached before that I've entitled, Three Things That Keep People From Living in Breakthrough. Because breakthrough is not something God intends for you to be in the valley, then you get your breakthrough, then you go back to the valley. God intends for you to live in continual victory. God doesn't promise victory. God promises victory after victory. Can you say amen? Amen. And so in preaching, I haven't preached anywhere near as long as your pastor, obviously, but 15 years doing it every day, you start seeing common patterns of things, people misunderstanding God's word, and then, you know, on the flip side, when someone receives a miracle, when somebody has stage four cancer driven out of their body, and they write in and say, I always thought X, and then when you preach, Y came out to me. So you start seeing a pattern of how the enemy warps people's thinking contrary to the word of God that allows them to stay in bondage. And I believe God's going to use these few minutes before we pray together where actually I believe many people will get their breakthrough right while I'm preaching. And so 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe and Gilead, told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go to the east and hide by Kareth Brook, near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I've commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him, and camped beside Kareth Brook, east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning, and he drank from the brook. But after a while, the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I've instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. And he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? As she was going to get it, he called to her, bring me a bite of bread too, 12. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God. I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Everybody say, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There will always be enough flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. And I told you this is New Living Translation version 2, and version 1, verse 16 says, no matter how much they used, there was always plenty left over. Can you say amen? Amen. So that's God's financial plan. It's not you taking every Saturday to clip coupons for four hours and go on a website to find what gas station selling gas three cents a gallon cheaper, packing a lunch and driving to Waco to go gas up on the weekend. God doesn't need you. There's people like that. Websites, most of them run by Christians. Oh, I found a place where gas is $1.79, so it's six cents cheaper. Uh, Now, it is 30 miles out of the way, so we drive over there to gas up. Well, you know, you start thinking, you got a 20-gallon tank to save six cents a gallon. So you've used this wonderful thing God gave you called a brain. You have the mind of Christ, but you've used it to find a way to save yourself a dollar twenty and burnt more than a dollar twenty worth of gas driving thirty miles one way and thirty miles back. God's not, I'm not talking about poor stewardship. That's good to negotiate. It's good to hardcore negotiate. We've negotiated things so hard that people say, "I can't believe you're a Christian." Amen. Well, that's fine. They can think whatever they want. Uh, 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 we we get three price quotes, all that stuff. But I'll tell you, like this crusade we're doing. When I did the crusade last year, my crusade director said to me, what's the budget on this? Well, how the heck am I supposed to know? That's the first crusade I've ever done. So I told him, just get the best of everything. And I said, get at least three price quotes. And whatever it costs is what it costs. But I made up my mind, I'm not getting on some stage that a youth group volunteered to build 
build and borrow a sound system that's inadequate for, for the park. All this, I feel like when we came into Philadelphia representing the gospel of Jesus Christ, everything should make the city remark, wow, that's the nicest sound system I've ever heard. See, heard. That's the nicest video screens. That's the nicest lighting. God isn't looking for you to save him money. He owns all the silver and he owns all the gold. And so God's prosperity, and I'm bringing this up for a reason, because most Christians, number one, don't even get into the area of money management and prosperity. But then when they do, most of them stop at money management. You know, uh, Dave Ramsey, that kind of thing, which is fine. It's good to know to budget money. There, there's Christians that are absolutely, they need courses like that. Never had a father, never learned how to spend money. You know, basically they just realize they're out of money when they're out of money. Hey, it's hot out, let's go for ice cream. On second thought, let's not go out for ice cream. And so it's good to learn how to budget. Jesus said, if you can't handle, handle common money, who will trust you with true riches? So God looks at that stuff. But I want to show you something, because in this breakthrough meeting, I'm talking about a God, not just that gives you wisdom on how to handle, but a God that makes a way where there is no way. You could have sat that widow down with the best financial advisor on the planet. They're in famine. There's no dew. There's no rain. You can't budget one meal to last another three years. So there are people that are in a situation where if God doesn't do a miracle, they can't manage lack. You can't manage. There has to be a creative power from the hand of God to bring you out. And I want to tell you something on this closing night. God said, I'm always the same. I never change. I am the Lord God and I change not. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Thank God for the principles of the Bible. You need them. But if you're in a dire strait like that woman is, there is a God that can reach down from heaven, pull you out of any problem, and set your feet on the rock to stay. And he'll do it for you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe that with me, rejoice right up front. Clap your hands and give him one more mighty shout. Say this, no matter how much I use, there'll always be plenty left over. Say it so the devil can hear you. Say, no matter how much I use, there'll always be plenty left over. Hallelujah. Man, I, it took me a little while to get in on that. I went to India the first time, and uh, I didn't know what the exchange rate was. I never looked. This was years back. And so I just thought, you know, usually when you go to another country, whatever the exchange rate is, it evens out. So I thought, well, it would be good to have at least $500 in case my visa card doesn't work or something so I, I can get out of a jam. Well, the exchange rate, it's even more favorable now for an American, but back then it was like 55 to 1. So when I got $500 worth of Indian rupees, I had $25,000 of their currency. And it doesn't even, even out. You know, it's not, it's not like they adjust. It's so far away that, like, you, you know, I was rich. I had two hermetically sealed bags of cash, of Indian cash. I felt like moving there. I felt like, well, why would I be middle class over here? I could just move over here and get a monocle like the planter's peanut guy, swing a cane. So anyway, I kept the one brick of cash in my, in my suit, which was, you know, I'm sure my guardian angels were sweating a little bit because the pastor took me to a slum in Mumbai to pray for Christians that were there. Well, I go in, and uh, all of the people want prayer for the same thing. I have sores on my arm. I have sores on my leg. Well, I'm not a doctor. I went to pray. They just wanted prayer for the sores. And when I went to pray, I felt checked in my spirit. Those sores are from malnutrition. That, so, you know, address the root of the problem. So I, I had the translator ask them in these little metal huts, 107 degrees, dirt floor, baby crying, no food. That's the first time I saw real poverty. I mean, this will make you either not, this may make, make you not like me, but growing up in America, I just, you almost become callous to poverty because it's like driving here. You go by the intersection, there's a grown man, I need money for food. Yes, so do I. That's what motivates me to work. And the Bible says a man that doesn't work should not eat. 
So you're actually working it. You, I'll help women and children. I never help men. I walk by Philadelphia. You know, I had guys. America's the only country you have people beg money off you that weigh more than you do. I made, I made a beggar in downtown Philadelphia. He laughed hard. He had to easily weigh 320 pounds. And he said, can I have money for a sandwich? I said, now between me and you, who should be giving who money for a sandwich? <laughs> he laughed. Thank God he didn't stab me. Amen. <laughs> but then when, when I went to India, you know, I'm a very pragmatic thinker. I'm not a crier. I've never watched the Lifetime Movie Network in my life. If somebody's in trouble, I don't cry with them. I start to think, how can we get out of trouble? And then often in America, that's why I won't have compassion, because I think, well, if I were you, I'd do this, this, and this, and I'd be out of the woods in 24 or 48 hours. But then with these people in India, they were in a caste where they're not allowed to go to school, forbidden by their last name. Can't go to school, can't get a job. No one's allowed to hire them. They're untouchables. You're not allowed to touch them. And you know me, I told you anything the devil tells you not to do once, what do you do? So every night when I open the meeting up, I'd say, everybody that's in the untouchable cast, come up on the stage. They'd all come up on the stage, and I'd give all of them a hug and then tell them to sit back down. Amen. Just cause trouble. So anyway, when I started to think of these people and the situation they were in, I thought, well, if I was her, there'd be nothing I could do in the natural. Now, you, you know, I could move mountains with my faith, but I'm talking about natural steps. And it broke my heart. Because when I went over to India, my wife had just had a, a baby. You know, if you've had a baby, it's hard enough when your kid's crying, when, you're, when you've got formula in the refrigerator, when your wife's milk, breasts have milk to feed them. It's bad enough. Can you imagine your kid crying in the night and your, their, your wife's breasts don't have any milk because your wife hasn't eaten for two days? You just have to listen to the kid cry out? That bothered me, and I don't get bothered easily. So I'd say, I, I started to say to him, I'll pray for your arms, but before I do, When's the last time you've eaten? Two days ago, we found some berries. Okay, do you know where a supermarket is? So the translator would ask him, yes, we know where one is. I'd just reach in, grab, you know, two or three work, weeks worth of salary and hand it to him and say, I'll pray, but go buy some food. They'd drop to their knees and start crying. And I, man, I felt good. So then we go to the next house. They want prayer for the same thing. Okay, here you go. Here you go. Man, I was just walking through that slum, passing out money. I felt, I felt good. And so when I finished, I felt so good. Them all hugging me and kids, thank you. And then when I went back to the hotel, I started crying. I thought this was terrible, man. I, I mean, I was able to help like 20 families. But this, is, this stinks. You know, they're going to get hungry again. Who's going to help them? And I felt the Lord speak to me. You did a good thing today. Are you going to make that a one-day thing? Or are you going to make this part of your life? And I, I thought, uh, I, no, I'm going to make it part of my life. So I texted Adalis, who was back in the States, because she had just had the baby. I didn't bring her over to India. I said, call. I told her the organization to call. It's one your church is hooked up with. And I said, tell them we'll feed 40 kids a, a, a month, which at that time I lived in an 800-square-foot apartment, and that was equal to my rent payment. But I got such a heart for that. I thought, I would rather... You know, if, if I can't make my rent, you know, and I was running it like capacity, money-wise. So to, to do that was like a real step. But I thought, you know what? I would rather have something happen to me and like have to figure something out if I can't make my rent. At least I have options. Those people don't have any options. But then that was when I told you last night, the next night or the next week when I came back from India after making that pledge to f feed 40 kids a month was when I went to that little church and. Fitchburg, Massachusetts, that had 140 people, 120, their record for offerings coming in for a minister in their 30-year history was $5,200. My personal record in nine years, the most money I'd ever had come in was $9,600 in a week, and that first week, $92,000 came in. That was when I started to realize that when God said in Proverbs 28, 27, he that cares for the poor will never lack anything. I started to realize that doing that was not really helping them, it was helping me. So I, I'm, not, I'm not stupid, you know. If I do that and it kicks 92,000 back to me, I called immediately. I said, double it, 40 to 80. I, so enough that their office called back and said, are you sure? that you meant to put that extra zero? 
We think we might have run your pledge twice. I said, no, I doubled my pledge. So then it goes to 80. Well, the thing was, I told them then to up it to 100 shortly after that. So when I would preach and talk about our ministry, I would say we feed 100 kids every, every day. And uh, then we have a meeting. This is two Januaries ago. The record for that church was 5,500, I think, in thir their 35-year existence. The most money they had ever had come in for a guest speaker was 5,500. And we had $187,000 come in. And I mean, I never took less, more than five minutes on the offering. It was totally supernatural. So I said to my wife, I said, listen, you know, the, the old saying, I said it last night, fools believe in luck, wise men believe in cause and effect. So if I see a record offering come in like that, I said to my wife when we were driving, I said, we've clearly tapped into something. What do you think it is? And she said, I can tell you what it is. You kept telling everybody we were feeding 100 kids every day, and when we checked, we had never upped it. We were only doing 80. So to make up for it, I upped it to, 100, to 200 kids a day to make up for all the months that you told everybody 100 without ever telling me. Now, 200 a day was a little more than the lease payment I was making on our office. So it wasn't a small commitment. In fact, if I, I, I was glad I wasn't aware that any of that was going on. But she said, I just did that, and then that came on. Well, then we kept going. Everything kept increasing. Then I upped it to 800, and I'm about to up it to 1,000 kids a day. Why? Because God made you not so you have to watch your pennies. If you put the kingdom first, the Bible says no matter how much you use, there will always be plenty left over. Can you say amen? I was actually born with cerebral palsy. The doctors never expected me to be able to walk on canes, never expected me to even be able to take a few steps on my own. They actually told me that I would be dead by the time I was seven years old. Amanda Dumont never expected the Lord to touch her during Festival of Life in West Virginia back in September of 2016. I honestly thought at first it was a joke because I went to church when I was younger but never really felt God in my life. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Something told me to go down and try it one last time. And then the power of God fell. When Festival of Life began, Amanda's muscles were so weak that she needed someone to push her around in a wheelchair. By the end of the week, she was walking with a walker and made this declaration. I will with the power of God, be walking on my own. Here's Amanda six months later. She's graduated from the walker to Canes. I feel alive, honestly. I feel that I could do anything with God's help. It's not just her body that was healed. God is beginning to restore her life. Once homeless, two months after the Festival of Life, Amanda married her boyfriend, Thomas, and they now have a home and are plugged into a church. God will change your life. He's changed ours. Everybody say, no matter how much I use, there'll always be plenty left over. Lift your hands and say it convincingly. Say, thank you, God, from this day forward. No matter how much I use, there will always be plenty left over. Now with your hands lifted, just begin to open up your mouth and give God thanks. No more lack. No more run out. You'll never be broke another day in your life. In the name of Jesus Christ. That woman probably felt like slapping Elijah. I got one meal left, and then my son and I are going to die. Okay, make a little for me first. Did you not hear what I said? She didn't understand that God hadn't given instruction for her to give to help Elijah. 
He was already getting, God could have sent more birds. That is the, the thing that has crippled the prosperity of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Giving people the mentality that you're helping the church or helping the preacher. God will accomplish his will on the earth with or without your financial help. If, listen to me, if everyone in this church stopped giving, nothing this church is doing would stop, it would increase. Because people didn't send Pastor Gene to Arlington, God sent Pastor Gene to Arlington, and the one who sends the person is the one who backs them. There was nobody, there was nobody to give to Elijah. Everybody was starving. Did Elijah miss a meal? Did Elijah miss a meal? Now let me tell you, it would have been enough of a miracle if ravens came once a day with bread, a first course and a second course. Bread. Here's your, here's your bread while you wait. My brother will be by shortly with your meat. How would you like your steak cooked? Uh, medium rare. You understand that's a cool red. I'm so sick of the waiter telling me it's a cool. Yes, I've eaten at restaurants before. I'm not six. I know it's a cool red center. Amen. Then they come by and feed them twice a day. So if God, what does the Bible say? If you won't praise God, what will cry out? The rocks. So God has instituted that he'll never be without praise. If you refuse to do it, Rocks will do it. So what is, the be God's gonna get praise either way. So when you think of it, my praise isn't helping God. My praise is causing God to enter into my praise and clear my enemies out. Well listen, did you know it's the same way with giving? That, that's why I refuse. You heard me catch myself the one morning when I said, we need more altar workers. You know, we had 908 first time decisions for Christ in Vineland, New Jersey in one night. And if you only have 100 altar workers, you can't have a nine to one ratio. You'll lose decisions. So I started because it, I'm undoing 25 years of training to say we need help. Paul said, not that I was ever in need. Can you say amen? amen. And I know that people can say whatever they want. If everybody said we're not gonna help you, God, God would do something. I don't know whether he would make trees animated like Scooby-Doo and they'd walk by their roots and help me fill out the cards, but God's work will never suffer because people refuse to do it. God will send help. Did anybody help Jesus pay his taxes or did God give him an instruction to tell Peter, catch a fish and the first fish you catch will have what? What in its mouth? A gold coin and it'll be enough to pay your taxes and my taxes. God is not limited by people's willingness to do something or not doing. God, if he commands you to do something, that's why it's so key. The Lord is my shepherd. First, you have to know you're going somewhere because the Lord sent you. But anywhere the Lord sends you, his supplies are committed from heaven to back you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're picking a place to live because you want to be close to mom and dad, you're making a mistake. Everything in a life of breakthrough has to start with being led by the Spirit and then obeying the leading of the Spirit. And don't wait for your own message from God when you haven't obeyed the simple instructions of the Bible. If I ask you who your pastor is, and your answer is you stuttering for three minutes, and then saying why you don't have a home church, you're gonna be in trouble, I don't care who lays hands on you. You have to hear the voice of the Spirit, first from the written word of God, and then God will fine tune. When you begin to obey, hallelujah, the commands of scripture, then that's where the voice of the Holy Ghost comes, where he'll fine tune the general instructions to make them specific instructions. And when you follow the leading of God, God never leads backwards. God never leads for you to survive and tread water. God always leads forward. Isaiah 48, 17. I am the Lord thy God who teaches you 
to profit and leadeth thee in the way that thou shouldest go. Oh, that you would have listened to me. Then your peace would have been like a river. You find people, they don't have peace. Nothing's working out. There is a problem with the path they're walking on. There is no prayer that substitutes for disobedience. You can't disobey what God said and try to correct it by getting people to pray for you. You have to set your life and say, Father, I lean not unto my own understanding. I acknowledge you in all my ways, and you will direct my paths. Then you realize that in doing that, hallelujah, God never is going to lead you down. Quit looking at who's going to help you on earth. If the Lord is your helper, brother, you are set up to flourish. God will never fail you. Thanks for watching Revival today. If you had emptiness inside of your heart and you felt it start to leave your body as you heard that word of truth from the word of God, that was the Holy Spirit. It's like a healing balm. And there's so much more of that where that came from. If you've never experienced that before and you would like to accept Jesus as your savior, I'd like to pray with you. Repeat after me. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I confess with my mouth that you are the son of God. I believe in my heart that you rose from the dead and I know that you are alive today. Jesus, thank you for washing away my past and for making me new and whole. I love you, Jesus, and I want a new life in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the family of God. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ, and it really is that simple. Now all you have to do is just immerse yourself in the word of God. Start by, of course, reading your Bible, but also make sure that you're surrounded by lots of other ways, a lot of worship music, a lot of positive influence. Did you know Revival Today Radio is an actual radio app. You can download it in the App Store and listen to it 24 hours a day. You can also connect with us on the social media platforms that are listed right on your screen. And even more, we would like to connect with you personally. Go to our website, revivaltoday.com, and click on the link that says, I just got saved. In fact, we wanna send you a very special gift completely free at absolutely no cost to you. We will not ever share your information with anyone, and we will send you something that will help you to encourage you in your walk with the Lord. Thank you so much for watching Revival today. And remember that God loves you, and we love you.